Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. So obviously the Gospel that I just read was not the Gospel that was in your bulletins. That Gospel in your bulletins is actually from last Sunday. But never fear, in God's economy everything always balances out, and I actually mentioned that Gospel in my sermon today, so moving on. So women have been calling folks out all week. If you pay attention to things like the Video Music Awards, you know that while accepting one of those awards, female rapper Nicki Minaj called out pop singer Miley Cyrus. And the language that she used wasn't all that different than what Jesus said to the Syrophoenician woman in today's gospel. The woman who had come to him seeking healing for her demon-possessed daughter He calls her a dog. But what's most important for me is what happens next. And what happens next reminds me of the old story about a fire and an explosion one night in a small town chemical plant. A plea for assistance goes out to all the neighboring fire departments. The chemical company president even offers an incentive We must save our secret formula, as he announces. They're in a vault at the center of the plant. Any fire department who can save them and bring them out safe will get $50,000. Well, the fire escalates a few minutes later, and he doubles the reward, $100,000. Just then, the piercing wail of a siren approaching can be heard louder and louder, until a volunteer, a local volunteer company, understaffed and with second-hand equipment, roars through the gates and drives straight into the heart of the flames. The firefighters hop hop off their rig and they battle the blaze from the inside out. And within minutes, it's all over but the mopping up. The flames are gone, the formulas are recovered, The company president is so overjoyed that he gives them twice what he had promised, $200,000. He personally thanks each volunteer individually. What do you intend to do with the reward, he asks their captain. Well, the captain replies, the first thing we're going to do is to get those brakes fixed. (laughs) I said it was an old story, right? But the Syrophoenician woman in today's gospel is a little bit like the volunteer fire company. No brakes, full steam ahead, operating on sheer hope, she plows right into Jesus' refusal to heal her daughter. And she changes it from the inside out. 
Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, he tells her. But she calls Jesus out, and her speedy comeback changes his mind. Sir, she says, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. It's such a great comeback, in fact, that we hear echoes of it in our right one Eucharist, in the prayer of humble access. Lord, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs from under thy table, it says. But thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Hmm. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of mercy in this Jesus we meet today. As encounters with him go, it doesn't get much more complicated than this one. This woman is a Gentile, for starters, and a woman in a male-dominated society. And not just any woman, but a Phoenician with ties to Syria. Remember all the Old Testament stories about Queen Jezebel, who persecuted the prophets and targeted Elijah for death? Also a Phoenician. So the presence of this woman in our story today evokes lots of suspicion for lots of reasons. Not only does she break social taboo by approaching and speaking to Jesus, she throws herself at his feet when he is trying to just get away from it all. It could only get worse, of course, if a demon is involved. <laughs> because the conventional wisdom of the day said that her daughter's demon was an indictment of the Syrophoenician woman's moral failures. Jesus, on the other hand, has his own problems. His ministry in and around Galilee has placed him in direct conflict with the Jewish religious authorities. Last week, they questioned his faithfulness because his disciples ate with defiled hands. Jesus called them hypocrites and declared it is not creeds but deeds and that the heart alone determines purity. He has retreated into Gentile territory, into Tyre and Sidon, in hopes of avoiding the crowds that have been following him. And so what happens? The Syrophoenician woman happens. This is no gentle Jesus, meek and mild, more like narrow-minded, more like racist, some have explained away his odd behavior as an attempt at humor, or that he was merely testing the Syrophoenician woman. Others say it isn't really all as harsh as it sounds, that he used a word for puppy, not dog. But dogs were thought of in Israel as more or less sort of like a largely a, a, a rat, just a little bit bigger than a rat. So she shows up, and Jesus lets her have it. Tell us what you really think of her, Jesus. And then there is this strange miracle of the healing of the deaf-mute man through this strange spitting. And it all only begins to make sense when we hear the Aramaic word Jesus uses, ephatha, the equivalent of be opened. It isn't just the deaf man's ears that are being opened and his tongue being released, it is the opening up of Jesus' ministry to the Gentiles, the community for whom Mark is writing. And it isn't just a Syrophoenician woman calling folks out this week either. Some of you may have seen the E! News that, that went out on Thursday. Two other strong women whom I hold in very high regard, presiding Bishop Catherine Jefford Shorey and president of the House of Deputies, Gay Clark Jennings, have called out the entire church and all of us in the process. They have joined with other people of faith around the nation, around the globe, to designate today as a day to confess, to repent, and to commit to end the sin of racism. Today has also been set aside to commemorate the Union of Black Episcopalians, which grew out of priest Alexander Crummel's efforts to develop strong black congregations in cities during a time when the church, yes, the Episcopal church, was segregated. I grew up in one of those historically black churches, St. Matthew's in Detroit. 
Here is your God, our Old Testament prophet Isaiah tells us today. God will come and will save us. The eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. What are the ways we are blind? To whom do we turn deaf ears? A friend of mine who teaches journalism once told me about a classroom exercise she crafted to specifically attempt to open eyes and to unstop ears. She deliberately staged a scene that unfolded in this way. As she was lecturing beginning journalism students, suddenly the door opened and two young men entered the classroom. One was white, the other black. They were arguing with each other. The fight escalated. Push came to shove, and finally, the white guy pulls a knife and appears to stab the black guy. Then the two ran out of the room together. My friend instructed her students to write a news story about what they had just seen. Every student reported that the black guy had stabbed the white one, the exact opposite of what had actually happened. How do we see? How do we hear? These are difficult things for us to talk about. And so I want to kind of turn the conversation a little bit by talking about privilege. And a way to talk about privilege that kind of takes some of the emotion out of it so we can have an honest and open discussion is by using the analogy of bikes and cars. Now, bikes and cars share the same highways, right? But cars don't have to worry about cracks and rocks the way bikes do. Cars don't have to worry about bikes the way bikes have to worry about cars. If there's a bump in the road, it might take the car to the body shop, but it could take the bike to the hospital. That is an example of privilege, when a system benefits one group of people over another group. Privilege means having automatic advantages, sometimes so much so that they are taking, taken not as privilege, but for simply just being the way things are. Privilege means you don't have to consider another person's reality. Of course, in this analogy, the person in the car still has other worries, like bigger vehicles or reckless drivers. The driver in the car may be preoccupied with getting lost or with making car payments, or worried about his or her passengers, or about whomever she or he will see at their destination. So with all those priorities and concerns, it's not that they don't relate to the person on the bike. The person on the bike simply just does not register with them. Or perhaps it seems to excuse them from even thinking about the person on the bike because, well, after all, they have their own problems. Perhaps each of us who drives can discover opportunities to empathize with those on bikes. Perhaps we can explore how to do this together. The silliness of the VMA Awards aside, I think Nicki Minaj asked a valid and a valuable question at the end of her tirade. What's good, she said, what's good? So what's good about today's gospel? Well, in this morning's gospel, we have a confrontation between privilege and non-privilege that leads to transformation and healing for everyone. Even Jesus and his ministry are transformed. Miracles and healings happen from the inside out. We begin to see with new eyes what we had not seen, to see those we had not seen. God opens our eyes. God loosens our tongues. God has unstopped our ears, and like the Syrophoenician woman, we have an opportunity to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, to listen to those whose presence goes unseen or is otherwise ignored. We are called out, called upon to speak truth to power. What is good is we see and hear God in all of our own stories and our story together, and we are empowered to speak God's truth. The good is that we can be opened, 
Ephatha. Amen.